Welcome to Southgate. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I just want to make sure that uh, if you are joining in with us today that you are connected with a local church. Uh, we hope and we pray that if you're in the North Grenville area that you are connected to Southgate in a physical way that you are coming out to services and you are joining in on the events that are happening in person. And if you're wondering how you can get connected to some of those things, uh, we would just say that you could sign up for the email uh, that uh, goes out weekly as well. You can follow us on our socials and uh, check in on the website to see what is going on in person and in our community. And so uh, we want you to be connected in that way. And uh, if you want to participate in what we are doing by giving financially, that will be up on the screen. We hope and we pray that this service is a benefit to you and your walk with Jesus. Well, Merry Christmas. Today we are going to be talking about how to move really from comparison and coveting to contentment. Now to illustrate this, I have brought something from my house. It wasn't easy to get here, but we did it. And so I've brought the treadmill here today from my house. And uh, and you know what? I, the treadmill is an interesting thing because it, it, it teaches you, you know, how to work out. You can do other things while you're on the treadmill. Now, how many of you here today have treadmills at your house? All right, hands up. Now, how many of you hang your clothes on your treadmill. I mean, it's like confession time. How many of you actually, that's what you use your treadmill for, to hang up your clothes, your towel, your jacket, or whatever. It's just sitting there. Now, I don't use my treadmill very often, but here's when I do use a treadmill, and it's kind of embarrassing, but I will use a treadmill oftentimes when I go to a, a hotel. And so a uh, hotel, like when you're at a hotel, it's like you're living a alternate life, all right? And so this is maybe like the you that you envision yourself being. And so I'm at the hotel, I go down to the gym, and, uh, and, and, and I go down, uh, I don't, I, I, I'm the kind of guy that I just hop on the treadmill. Like I, I, I don't, I'm not, I'm, when I play hockey, I don't stretch, I just go right into it. I'm just all in right away. Because let's be honest, stretching is a little bit for losers. And so I don't stretch at all. I just hop right on and I just give her because ultimately, um, you know, I've, I've never heard of like a cheetah. Cheetahs do not stretch before they make the kill, right? They just go out. So that's what I'm doing. And the other thing, when I go on the treadmill, I don't really have a, I don't really have a plan. And so uh, sometimes you have a plan when you get on, on the treadmill or you you have a workout or this thing you might have like a certain workout that you can do according to plan but here's what I do my plan is that when I get to the gym I hop in the treadmill the first thing I do is uh, I just kind of like glance at my neighbor I glance at my neighbor and what speed are they going like what what are they doing so I look over here this guy he might be uh, I notice he's doing like a, a seven and so uh, I'm looking at myself I'm doing a four and so then I, I, need to, I need to pick it up a little bit because my plan, really, the only goal I have going on the treadmill at the gym is to, to beat the guy next to me, right? And so that's the whole reason I'm going to win this. I don't even know what I'm winning. I'm winning the treadmill race. And so, and so I hop on here and I'm just giving her, there's no plan. And I go until I can't even run anymore, but at least I've beat the guy beside me. I'm going at a faster pace than he is. And then, you know what? I'm not going to see that treadmill, treadmill, if I'm honest. I'm not going to see that treadmill until the next time I'm staying at a hotel. Now, sometimes when we're on that treadmill, the reason why I brought this in here is, is sometimes that is the way that our minds are going. And it might not be, it's relatable here, but how do you get off the treadmill of comparison? I mean, you're on this thing, you're looking at other people, the way they're living, but what they're doing, what they're spending their money on, the, the, how they're vacationing. And it might not be a treadmill, but you know what? There's, there's other thing that happens in our life that is really, it, it's a treadmill for our minds. We don't have to go to the gym for it. In fact, we just pull it out of our pocket and it's these phones. And you scroll through them and, and you scroll, and it's like a treadmill and you continually scroll through. It never ends. And, and so and so they went to Cabo. And so and so they're in Dominican Republic right now. And so and so they just, they're, they're posing with the picture of their new car. 
And so and so, congratulations on the sale of your house and the purchase of the new one. So and so just had a child. So so and so got a promotion. I'm proud of so and so because their their son or their daughter they just graduated with honors. Uh, so and so is doing this and doing that, and and it's this revolving kind of treadmill of your mind that you you're just how do I get away from this? How do I get off of this treadmill of comparison? And and I would say the worst of it comes out around Christmas time. And looking at what other people are doing, who they're getting together with, what I don't have that other people do. And you start thinking about this, and it's, it's true in life. It always has been. As much as it is now, it, it always has been, even in biblical times. And it's comparison. It's, it's coveting. It's envy. And so what I want to talk about today is, is, is how do you get off of that treadmill? How do you get off of the treadmill of comparison and coveting? How do you get off the treadmill of, of, of social media? How do you get the treadmill uh, off the treadmill of your mind as you continue to play these things out? Because, because he, here's, that, here, here's that thing. that it, 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 It's all-encompassing. And it sucks us in deeper than we ever want to go. See, here's the problem with comparison. Here's the problem with coveting. It lies to us. And there's two primary lies that it tells us. The first one is this. If you get that thing, then you will be happy. If you get that thing, then you will be happy. The second thing that it tells us is this. You're not enough. If you get that thing that they have... You will be happy, and you're not enough because look at what they have, and look at who they are, look what they've accomplished. And so if you get that car, if you get that house, if you get that phone, if you get that computer, if you get that vacation, if you get that girl or that guy or that job, then you will be happy, but it's a lie. How do I know? Because the last thing never made me happy. The last thing, it lied to me. That's how I know that this thing, it will not make me happy because the last thing never did. It didn't work. It told me that once I got it, I would be, but then I got it and I wasn't. And so I just want the next thing. But then the, 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 this other part of it here, you're not enough, is you're, you're not tall enough, you're not fast enough, you're not good looking enough, you're not accomplished enough, you're not smart enough, you haven't achieved enough, you're not successful enough, I don't have enough, I'm not enough. And that's the lie that, that swirls around on that treadmill is that I'm just, I'm just not enough. And so let's look at that first one here. That, that first thing is, is, is if you get that thing, then you will be happy. Let, let, let's break that down a little bit. So we all know the problems that social media brings our way. And, and the longer I have social media, really, the more I dislike it. It's, 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 it's a bad habit. It, it doesn't really bring out a whole lot of good in, in my mind. And some of us think that that's a, a young, maybe young teenage problem, teenage girl problem, but it's not. It's a, it's a guy problem. It's a girl problem. It's a young problem. It's an old problem. It's a human problem that we all have with coveting and, and comparison. It's, it's a human problem. In fact, in fact, Exodus 20, verse 17, it reads like this. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servants or his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Now, now remember, God is giving... Oh, treadmill shutting down. The, remember, God gives us the, the Ten Commandments here, Right? He gives them to Israel after they've been enslaved for 400 years. And, and, and these are like moral building blocks for society. They're, they're things that pretty much everyone agrees with. These are things that you should not do. I mean, it's not really uh, controversial in any way. We would all agree with these things. Like, do not lie, do not steal, don't commit murder. They're not controversial. We would be like, yeah, these are, these are things that generally we don't want in our society. But then you get to, I mean, that's the first nine. Then you get to the tenth here, the, the last one. You get to the tenth commandment. And it says, don't covet. Like, what's up with that? 
Like that's, that seems like it's, 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 it's totally different than all the rest. Don't covet. I mean, that's pretty big uh, general statement here. It doesn't feel like it really fits. See, God knows, he knew that there's more ways to be enslaved than to be freed. There's more ways that tangle us up, that bog us down, that keep us in the ruts than, than free us. He, he knew that. He knew that it was such a huge problem. And this treadmill of comparison, he knew that it could wear us out. And so he needs to include it in here. And, and, and you know this. I mean, have you ever borrowed money that you don't have to buy something that you don't need to impress someone else? That people do that all the time if they're dating someone or, or if they needed to buy that ring or that car or that thing to impress someone else and you borrow money that you don't have in order to do it. We, we covet all the time in our life. We compare. In fact, Proverbs 22, it says the borrower is enslaved to the lender. And a lot of us have real big problems, especially as interest rates creep up and, and people wonder how they're going to pay their homes off or how they're going to pay that line of credit off. And, and this thing becomes more real than we even know. And here's the problem with social media, that we're not only coveting our neighbor, but now our neighbors, now that we have social media, my neighbor is all around the world. And so I build a treehouse with my boys and I'm pretty happy about it. My boys are pretty happy about it. And then all of a sudden, at nighttime, I'm scrolling through my phone and I'm comparing my treehouse, comparing my treehouse to the treehouse in Tofino, BC, that this millionaire just built for his kids. And I'm like, whoa, well, my 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 treehouse really stinks compared to that. Because our neighbors are everywhere. And so, and so God speaks this to us in this real, real way. And He's and He's saying this to us because. You can't be generous and covet at the same time. It, it's impossible. To covet is to look at our neighbor and to say, I want what you have. I, I want to have that. I want what you have. But to be generous is to say, I want what I have to bless others, to, to, to move the kingdom of God forward, to claim more territory for him. And so Moses gives these, these ten commandments that are given by God and he, he shares them with the Israelites on Mount Sinai and Jesus gives the Sermon on the Mount and he addresses our hearts in Galilee. He gives us these eight Beatitudes and he begins to teach things to address the heart. And we pick it up here as we look at his, his first sermon here. We, we look at it in Matthew 5, verse 17. And it reads like this. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So Jesus is actually the only one that, can, that has ever lived out uh, uh, these Ten Commandments perfectly. He's the only one who's ever, he's without sin. He's the only one that's able to do that. But we continue on here in verse 21 and 22. It reads like this. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. So you've heard it said back on these Ten Commandments. You've heard that said, but now we're taking it even a step further is what Jesus says. And so, and so the law issue was with Moses and now with Jesus, it's a, it's a heart issue. And so don't even go there. Don't even think that way. And then we pick it up here in verse 27 and 28. It reads like this. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. You've heard it said, you remember what Moses said, you remember those Ten Commandments, but we're taking it a step further in addressing the heart here. See, Jesus talks about this stuff in his, in his sermon because he knows that we struggle with it so much. Not only do we struggle with this lie that we will not be happy with the things that we get, we struggle with this lie that we're not good enough. I will never be good enough. And so Jesus calls the disciples off of the treadmill and he calls them up and brings them to a mountain 
and says to them in Matthew 6, 21, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where, where is your heart? If you want to know where your heart is, look at what you buy. What Jesus doesn't say is he's, he doesn't say, if you want to know where your heart is, look at what you pray for. Which you would think that would be a good saying. He, he doesn't say, if, if, if you want to know where your heart is, look at what you read. If you want to know where your heart is, he doesn't say, look at what Bible study you attend, what church you go to. What he doesn't say is, if you want to know where your heart is, look at what education you have, or career standing, or, 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 or accomplishments that you have. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say what's in your calendar or your bank account. He doesn't say that about your heart. He says, look at how you spend your gifts and your talents, and your treasure. Because where you spend those, that is where your heart is. Then in Matthew 6, 22 and 23, it reads like this. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Now, this is a Jewish idiom here. This is a Jewish idiom. This is, this is kind of like when we say, hey, break a leg, or who cut the cheese? It is kind of like saying that, but the Jews, when they would say this, this was this idea. When they said, you have a good eye, they were saying that you are good at looking out for other people. That, that's, that's the idiom here. You, you are good at looking out for other people. And so Proverbs 22.9, it, it says this, Whose ever eye is good will be blessed because he gives of his bread to the poor. And so to have a good eye is to be generous. To have a good eye is, uh, uh, is to, be, to, be, to be blessing others, but to have a bad eye is to be greedy, to be, to be self-centered, to, to be blind to the needs of those around you. Because when you're generous, you light up a room. When you're generous, you, 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 give, you give sight to others. Instead of darkness, there is light. When you, are, when you are generous, you light up a church. When you're generous, you light up a family. You, you light up a, a neighborhood. You light up a, a village. You light up a town. Because people can tell when people are generous because it's so unusual. But when you're self-centered, when you're selfish, you suck the life out of a room. You suck the life out of a family. You suck the life out of a church. You suck the life out of a town, out of a neighborhood, out of a city. Someone who gives themselves away is like a light. It's like a breath of fresh air instead of sucking the life out of others. Matthew 6.24 reads like this. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Now the word for money here is actually the, the, the word mammon. And mammon is this idea. This is, we all know that, that, that money is not the sin, but it's the love of money. It's that spirit of greed, of, of lustfulness, of wanting more, of never having enough, of lavishness. It's, it's that spirit of mammon. It's the spiritual force that makes you want more. I'm not good enough. I need more things. I need, need more pleasure. I, I need more of this in my life. I'm never satisfied. It's never enough. Now, the, the closest I can relate to this is, is this restaurant that Emily and my boys and I, we go to when we're in Tennessee. It's called Paula Dean's. She's a cook. I think she's on the Food Network or something like that. And it's, it's a family-style place where they bring food to you. You select a, a bunch of dishes, and it's, it's the best-tasting food and the worst food for you. That, that's all how I can sum it, sum, summarize it. And it's all you can eat. So they just keep bringing food that they make fresh. They keep bringing it, bringing it, bringing it, until you can't eat anymore. I mean, it, it borders on sin how much you're eating here. And I, I just know that I, 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 there, there, there comes a point in that meal where I'm sitting at the table and they're like, okay, sir, what would you like for dessert? And I'm like, I actually, I can't, I don't think I can have dessert. Like, I, I'm, I'm so content. I'm so satisfied. I'm so full. 
that I actually don't even desire the dessert. I, I have no room for dessert. I'm satisfied. Philippians 4, 11, 12a says this, I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. He knows what it's like to be in need. This is, this is, he says, I, I have the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether, whether living in plenty or in want. This is Paul's saying, like, I, I have this secret. I, I, I have the secret of being content. And he says this in, in verse 13, that I can do all this through him who gives me strength. I have this, this secret of being content to be satisfied. To, I know what it's like to have everything. I know what it's like to have nothing. And I can be level-headed in all of it because I have the secret. I know what it means to be satisfied, to be filled, to be full. And so how do we do this? How do we do this? How do we be content? The first thing is this, fill, fill up. Fill up first. Before you do anything else, fill up first. What what does this mean? Read your Bible. Read your Bible. Fill up first. Nourish yourself first on God's Word. Communicate with God. Pray with God. Talk with Him. Uh, Share share about Him. Sing in the car. Sing worship songs to Him. Uh, Be in communion with Him. Talk to Him on a regular basis. Fill up first. Because here's what I find. The more that He fills you up, the less good sin looks. The more I'm filled up with that meal, the less I desire the dessert. I'm just, I'm just satisfied. I'm just content. And if we fill up first, sin doesn't really look good anymore because I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm level-headed. And my foundation is there. I'm, I'm satisfied. I'm full. And we need to fill up with Him before we jump on the treadmill of our thoughts. Before it just kind of goes revolving door that never ends, whether it's social media or whatever else, that you are satisfied before you even get to that place. Number two is run your race. And I'll point your attention to Proverbs chapter 4, verse 25. It reads like this. Let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. I think about that as I run on the treadmill, as, uh, as I run a race. Now, I can get tempted in my position, um, to, to just be totally honest, to look at other pastors, to look at other churches, to look at other ministries, to look at other pastors that are far better communicators than I am, to look at other pastors who are far better shepherds than I am, who are far smarter than I am, who are doing far better things, in my opinion, than, than I am able to do. And do you know how much it helps me to do that? It doesn't help me at all. It's never helped me at all. I can celebrate their calling while I walk in mine. That's what I've come to. I can celebrate someone doing something great and not be, not, not be worried about that, how, how that affects me. I can celebrate something, something that someone else does that they're far better than I am. I can cheer them on and celebrate that and, and not worry about how that affects me. I, that's the kind of person I want to be because there's a race that only I can run, that no one else can run. There's a race that God has given me that he hasn't given someone else. And I am supposed to stay the course on my race, the race that God has given me. You don't want to be second place in someone else's race. You want to be first place in yours, the race that God has given you. And so run your race, run your race. Number three, make time to fast. I'll be honest, this is something I'm not the best at. But when I have done it, it really pays off. It's an interesting thing because, because we know that fasting is actually a really good thing to do for your body. I mean, physically, scientifically, it, it really is. But this is a spiritual element, not so much a, a physical thing for health reasons or dieting. This is spiritual thing that's happening here when you fast. Spiritual reasons. See, when you fast, it breaks the yoke of, of, of bondage to, to be addicted to things and stuff. 
When you fast, you're able to break those addictions. When you fast, you're able to focus on the hunger pains or the things that are going inside in you and reflect on God's goodness. You, because what, what I find is when I'm able to say, to say no to that sandwich, it's, it's far easier for me to say no to Amazon Prime. And when I'm able to say no to whatever it is for dinner that I feel like I really need, I'm able to say no at the checkout line when I want to buy that chocolate bar, right? I'm able to say no to other things. I'm able to break the yoke of addiction and bondage to things and to stuff. Which leads me to number four. Tell your money where to go. Don't let your money tell you where to go. You tell your money where to go. It gets me in trouble when I get in a treadmill and I, and I don't have a plan, right? And when I get on this treadmill and I look at my neighbors and how fast they're running, even though I haven't run in maybe a, a month, right? And I think I can keep up, or I don't stretch, or I, and I don't have any kind, it's just wishy-washy, just hop on there and press a whole bunch of buttons and go. It doesn't really work, right? It gets you in trouble when you do that, and it gets us in trouble when we don't have a plan for where our money goes. Well, when you, when you don't tell your money where to go, it will tell you where it wants to go. And your heart will follow it. It, it, That's really what happens. See, where our treasure is, there our heart will be also. And whatever we spend money on, it will tell others where our heart is. What we're, what we're, what we're addicted to, what we're, what we're really longing for, what our desires are. And so, uh, what I've lived on, what Emily and I try to live on is the 10, 10, 80 rule. It's to, to give 10% over to God, to, to, to yield our control, to give back to Him for what He's given us in the first place. And, and that's to, to help his, his movement to be a part in what He's already doing, to, to have a piece of that and say thank you. It's to give Him our first fruit, so that's a 10% for us. And then a 10% we save, we put it away for the future, for kids' education, for, for RRSPs, for, for, for whatever, investments, that kind of thing. And we, we take 10 and, we, and then we live on 80%. That's what we choose to do. And, and we focus in on that. We tell our money where to go. And it, and it gives us a guideline. Some people budget. Some people do it different ways. But this is, this is how we do it. See, it's interesting because... Um, I don't really do it anymore, but I remember in my early 20s, um, I, I did have some Tim Horton stock. And uh, it was when it was kind of going into the U.S. and, and, uh, and, and it was expanding and uh, corporate takeovers and that kind of thing. And we, I didn't really have a lot of stocks, but I would, I would go on and check that stock like uh, on a regular basis. Because I, I felt like I, I was an owner. In fact, I was an owner, and there's, I don't even know how many shares there are, and I think I only had maybe like five. But I was, a, I was an owner in that business. And it's funny, when you, when you do, you're interested in how those Tim Hortons are functioning, how, how they're running, and walking into that Tim Hortons, kind of, kind of feeling like I own the place, because I actually did own a little bit of it. And, and, and are, is this working? Are the cars in the parking lot? Is, is it working right? Because this was, I was invested in it. And when you're invested in something, you, you care about it. You, you want to be a part in it. I care. I'm, I'm an owner. I'm invested in it. And, and so tell your money where to go. Be invested in where you put your money. Be invested in where God leads you to go. Run your race. And if I'm going to, to summarize, I'll end with this. I can admire it, but I don't have to acquire it. I can say that's a nice car. That's a nice vacation. That's a nice house. That's a nice job. But I don't have to have it. Because what I have is enough. I'm satisfied and I'm content. Let's pray. God, I just pray for, uh, for our family here. Who, whoever's uh, coming along with us here on this journey today. And, and God, I just pray that we would, uh, we would fill up on you first. God, that, that, that we would be satisfied, that we would be filled, God, that we would break the, the addictions of, uh, of, of coveting and comparison and looking what other people are doing, God, and we could fix our eyes on you and run the race marked out just, just for us. We thank you that you've given a, a plan and a purpose. You've, you've given us gifts and talents and abilities, God, and we want to, to honor you with all that we have. 
And so, Father, we just pray that even as we, we kind of celebrate Christmas here and Christmas Eve and Boxing Day, Father, that, that as we do that, we would represent you in the best way possible. We would cheer other people on, that we would be content with what we have, God, and we would be satisfied and joyful in who you are and your leading in our lives. We pray these things in your name. Amen.